All right, so today we are doing the group B presentation uh, related to digital computation visualization uh, in my ARC 714 class. So today we have a group of um, students. I uh, will just uh, go through their names quickly at the beginning. Uh, we will have Hannah, Anshumi, Andy, Mitchell, Kirsten, Stefan, Rakishta, Colton, and the RAID uh, to present their research related to many different subjects uh, from Grasshopper plugins to uh, animation technique uh, with, um, you know, plugin like uh, Ladybug uh, and also some research related to Dynamo uh, in generative design, uh, lighting research uh, related to rendering, uh, also Grasshopper related to solar, environmental analysis, 3D printing, and the site design with Rhino. Okay, so it's a very large um, uh, range of topics. All right, so let's start uh, from the first one. Um, Hannah, if you are ready, uh, go ahead. You can share your screen. Uh, as usual, the full length presentation will be available in YouTube. Uh, so later I will share the link with uh, within the recorded video. All right. All right, I will share my screen. Yep. Right. Are you able Good. to see it? Yep. All right, um, so my um, presentation was on using EvoMass for optimization-based design exploration. Um, so first off, I looked at what is optimization-based design. And according to the creators of the EvoMass plugin, they said optimization-based design is aimed to leverage optimization as a means of information extraction for achieving a performance-aware, performance-informed design synthesis process, rather than purely looking for a design solution. So um, optimization-based design reveals architectural information relating to building performance. It helps explore multiple design alternatives and it uses results of optimal performance studies to inform and encourage the design process. And then next, um, obviously, what is the EvoMass plugin? It is a Grasshopper plugin that can be used for building mass design generation to explore optimal design. So um, this plugin can be used for rapid virtual prototyping of building massings. It uses both subtractive or additive form generation principles. And it includes an optimization or SSIEA algorithm that can output several high performing design solutions. Um, it also creates variants with high design variability and differentiation, which is why they said it stood out against a lot of other plugins that do the same um, because it does both of those things. And then the version I was using was version 0.3.0. .0. And the link to access the plugin is at the bottom of this slide. Um, so I did about a 15 minute demonstration. It's on YouTube and the link is included here. But for the purposes of this presentation, I just kind of wrote out the process. Um, so step by step, you want to start by downloading and installing the EvoMass plugin from Food for Rhino. Um, and then in Grasshopper, you'll choose either the additive or subtractive generative component. And then from there, whichever component you choose, you'll click Setup and enter the parameters for your massing. So these are things such as the span size and value in X and Y, the number of floors, your floor heights, your interior and exterior facade type, size and boundary constraints, number and size of additions, subtractions, et cetera. There's a couple more things. Um, and then for the rapid prototyping, you will set your sampling parameters. So this is where you'll input the number of rows and columns for the desired prototyping outcomes. And then lastly, you'll choose your operation. So uh, there's shuffle massing, which generates new massing options from the parameters you set. So if you don't like the original one, you can click shuffle massing and it'll generate a new one. Um, shuffle parameters will shuffle your parameter input, so it'll change some of your numbers. So this is good if you're doing something that you don't necessarily have to have 
set parameters um, and that'll change them. And then um, the operation set parameters is what creates your output. So that's what you're going to click um, to get your outputs. Um, and then after the rapid prototyping, you can use the example scripts provided or other grasshopper scripts to determine performance of massings relative to conditions of environment, site, et cetera. So um, with the EvoMass plugin from Food for Rhino, it also has four example scripts um, that are compatible with Ladybug. Um, so these are just example scripts that you can test like daylighting, solar irradiation, and a couple other things with your massings. So um, the benefits and uses of this plugin, it easily creates multiple iterations of building massings according to parameters set by the user. It and provides options and in enhancing information extraction to reveal optimal forms. Um, it doesn't require any parametric modeling or establishing workflow, so it greatly reduces time and speeds up the process of analyzing performance of different massings. It can be used for site analysis with respect to different environmental and performance factors, so sunlight hours, daylighting, solar irradiation, wind, passive solar performance, etc. And then the iterations can be tested in combination with Ladybug uh, version 1.2.0 to explore optimization. So like I mentioned before, the example scripts are included with the plugin on Food for Rhino. And then there are a couple limitations. Um, the plugin only creates basic orthogonal massings. Um, directly from your set parameters. So you'll still need to design your building after finding the optimal shape. This is really just like an early design um, phase. It helps you figure out what the best shape would be and then you would design from there. And then um, it doesn't take urban environment into account, only immediate surroundings. So with the example scripts, you can input a couple um, surrounding buildings, but it obviously won't take into account like the overall larger urban environment surrounding your buildings. Um, and then one more thing is that it is a newer plugin, so they are still working out some issues. I didn't really run into any, but they do make that note on Food for Rhino that there are like still some kinks they're trying to work out. So that's another thing. Um, but yeah, that's it. And then these are the references that I used. Very good. Uh, well, I can see this will be super useful for studio. Maybe in the first few weeks, you quickly generate a large number of iterations. Um, yeah. But again, you know, you re rely on other criteria to evaluate, right? The performance right. of this matching. This could be, you know, subjective, um, or based on the aesthetics, or based on the environmental analysis, right? Right. Right. All right. Sounds good. Well, uh, I think we can, same as the group A, we will hold all the questions, discussions at the end um, as a group. Uh, so we're going to just simply proceed uh, to the next person. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, so let's move on. Ashumi, go ahead. Hello, good evening. Good morning, everyone. I'll yeah. share my screen. Um, yep. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Yep. I can see it. Okay. Um, so I'll start with my um, research topic, which is to visualize futurism using animation. Um, and I'm taking a case of Greg Lynn's Animate Farm as a case study. Um, this is sort of a roadmap of my presentation today um, is what is futurism and then also defining what is animation. Um, how also Greg Lynn sort of sees animate form in his case study, which is called embryological house. And then at the end sort of see how I can use grasshopper um, to create um, the similar sort of mutations or explorations. Um, to start with, what is futurism? So futurism is a term that was um, that came out in early 20th century artistic movement um, in Italy. Uh, it sort of emphasized the dynamism, speed 
energy and power of machine and sort of like a modern lifestyle, which was more speedy. Um, even aesthetically, it was um, more about being faster um, and so, sort of uh, going beyond what we already have done in the past. Um, the future design sort of was more dynamic side. So um, the term futurism was coined by Marinetti and in his manifesto, he glorified these aesthetics with speed, power and movement. Um, and as you can see, there are these four main components of futuristic architecture, which are listed below, which are movement, technology, natural materials and science. Um, I've included a few examples just to get a gist of what futurism in architecture looked like from uh, a building which is like Chicago Tower from 1922. Um, and here is also one more example of Oscar Niemeyer's building in Brazil. Just like how the forms were in one example were geometric and the other were more smooth and moving toward this idea of more fluid sort of form making. A um, few more examples, uh, of course, Frank Gehry's Walt Disney Concert Hall and on this side is a skyscraper design in Dubai. Just to get a gist of what futurism is. Um, now I define what is animation. This definition is what I found from the book, uh, The Animate Form by Greg Lynn. So he defines animation as a term that differs from, but is often confused with motion. While motion implies movement and action, animation implies the evolution of a form and its shaping forces. Uh, to me, animation is a form under force and the process which it goes through while it is, while the force is acting on it and you sort of create these snapshots while the form is under force. So I sort of see animation like that. Um, so just reading more much about how architecture was not really used to these ideas of dynamism. So challenging these assumptions by introducing architecture to models of organization that are not inert will advance with will anyway was looking towards its advancement. Um, so just as the development of calculus drew upon the historical mathematical development that preceded it, so too will an animate approach to architecture subsume traditional modes of statics into a more advanced system of dynamic organizations. This was supposed to be more advanced sort of building of architecture. Uh, he sort of mentions it in his book um, and is also true based on his ideas of the form animation. I I included this image where um, there is one more idea of the forces in the space, which is not really uh, important to discuss here, but I thought it would be nice to include this. Um, in here, it, um, he sort of states that the space is not just a vacuum. It, it has uh, forces which sort of is the properties of flow, turbulence and viscosity, and he sort of shows how it also could affect the design or or form animation. Um, I include like two examples, which is types and results of a certain sort of animation done and what it results into. So animate design is defined by the co-presence of motion and force at the moment of formal conception. Uh, here it is about inverse kinematic animation. Uh, you can see the image on the right. The motion and shape of a form is defined by multiple interacting vectors that unfold in time perpetually and openly. This is one sort of an uh, animation technique, I would say. Um, and I've included one more technique, which is different from that one, which was in the first technique, we were looking at the motion um, of these people, uh, movement of these people and then tracking into a vectorial representation. Whereas here, the form of the technique which is used is superimposing um, of uh, 2D frames and then sort of creating a um, motionic painting. And this was the superimposition of a sequence of frames, produces memory in the form of spatial temporal simultaneity. This sort of phenomenon was termed by Siegfried Guerin and 
you can see the example in these two images, um, which are sort of paintings. In figure A is a painting by Marcel Duchamp, and in figure B by Umberto Pacchioni. Um, so these are two techniques which I wanted to highlight about what animation can do in different techniques followed. Um, last but not the least, this one was a technique which I want to sort of include as a case study, which is the embryological house uh, by Gredlin. Um, so the embryological house was inspired by evolutionary biology. So here, as we saw that there were two techniques, one was inverse kinematic, the second was superimposition of frames. Here, Greglin used the technique of evolutionary biology in sort of his way, and then he sort of developed his iteration of embryological house. Um, the, and the underlying conceptual crux of the embryological house lies within the idea of morphogenesis, which in biology means a process that creates form, especially within the embryo. Um, I'm just going over it. Uh, I then sort of uh, did like a step by step um, decode, which I also studied about what steps he followed. And you would see it in my research when I explain in the video. I would not go through it all right now. So just in a gist that these process where he followed and he used different softwares was his interpretation of what he things of biological mutation and morphogenesis. So he created, um, he started with a basic form, as you can see on the right side, which is a circular spline uh, with 12 control points. And then he sort of created his own methods of dividing those control points and manipulating and then sort of arriving at these mutations, I would say. So it's his interpretation. Um, yeah, um, he used uh, two dominating softwares, which one was Maya and the other was MicroStation. I have also a link of uh, just of his mutations in play through a video clip. You can watch it. If, um, at the end, I would like to highlight few plugins, which I feel is a good replication of animating form using Grasshopper. Um, since Maya is already is always there, I thought it would be nice to see what Grasshopper can do when it comes to animating a form. I start with uh, this plugin called Twin Curve, uh, which is a part of uh, Puffer Fish plugin. So in here, as you can see, um, in my tutorial, I have included what steps I have taken to create this um, whole script. Um, we have two basic curve. So this is the grid I start with and the second curve I call these. The first curve is a squared grid and the second curve is the hexagonal grid. So the transformation that um, occurs from moving from this to this grid is sort of documented through these forms and is what this command helps into. Um, this to me is a sort of a way of using Grasshopper in creating similar animated forms. I used um, also given as a reference in uh, Professor Ming's library. Um, this was called Animation Point script, where I saw that uh, I created a boundary curve and three defining points, which were one of this curve and all the points inside to create these field conditions, I call them. Um, and I created uh, these sort of screenshots of the animation that were the in-between process from moving from more dense field condition to a less dense field condition. Uh, and then I sort of uh, end with the meaning and the benefits or the function the, the plugin puffer fish sort of give. And I don't know why this GIF is not playing, but yeah. Um, to end with, uh, this plugin is what I feel is a good replication of getting animated form um, using Grasshopper. And um, functions of this plugins are like twi uh, twins, blends, morph, averages, transformations, and interpolations. You can see how it sort of creates these combination of forms from the basic form. Um, these components are accompanied by support components, which are useful methods for twin and blend or morph or lattice operations, such as making curves compatible. Um, 
this was it for my research where I sort of thought how can animate form be seen as a grasshopper script and not Maya also. Thank you so much. All right, All right. thank you. Um, I think animation definitely is a very powerful way uh, to generate forms, you know, using snapshot, uh, you know, keyframe, uh, morphing animation. There's many, many ways, or even the physics simulation. You can using simulation generate animations. Yeah. Uh, very interesting subject. Um, you know, later at, at the conclusion, we can discuss more. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right, uh, so let's move on to, um, I believe, Andy is the next one. All right, I can see you. <clears throat> um, can't hear you though. Turn on your mic. Here we go. Uh, yep. um. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So for my research project, I was looking at um, basic animation tools first with what Rhino had to offer and then using Grasshopper as a plugin. Um, so the, the objective and what I cover in my at length tutorial is uh, a few of the tools that Rhino has to offer. So a basic fly through animation and then uh, what they call a turntable animation and then uh, creating a grasshopper script that uses sliders to move and alter objects. And then I've, I end with compiling all of these images that um, Rhino creates and uh, putting them into Photoshop to create an animation video. So on the right is the base model for the animation, which is just uh, kind of like one facade there, which is what I used uh, throughout. So the software that I used, um, with Rhino and Grasshopper, I added two plugins. I added Weaverbird and Human. So I actually didn't really use much of Weaverbird, but it helps um, kind of with the meshing process of your objects. And then Human, the Human plugin I used mainly um, in reference to object properties, um, specifically material, which I actually ended up having some problems with, but I'll get to that later. Uh, so the fly through animation, it's pretty basic. Um, in Rhino, you have these animation tabs, and all the fly through is is creating a point and then the animation or a curve, and then the animation follows the uh, path. So um, you select the path, and you can control how many frames it's creating, um, what kind of view you want. So um, I used a rendered viewport. Um, you can use V-Ray, but the problem with V-Ray, uh, especially if you're in a time crunch, is that it will take all 120 frames and render each one. Um, so even though, like in this example, it's a, it's a pretty basic um, render view, and it might only take you know two minutes on your computer. Well, two minutes times 120 is two hours. So um, it's something that you could probably run overnight. But I just used the basic render view in Rhino. And um, once you get, um, once you create this, these frames, they go to a folder. And when you get to Photoshop um, and you open this folder, you open the very first image. Um, and then there's an option to create this image sequence, and that will automatically select all of the images after it. Um, and once you, this is open in Photoshop, you can export as a render video, and you'll end up with an MP4 file. So. This is the basic fly through, which really isn't too interesting because it's just one bay. So there's nothing to see as you turn around and look back. Um, but that was kind of the first um, form of animation that I explored. And then uh, rotation animation in Rhino is almost simpler. So they call it turntable. That's the command. Um, and it's, it's almost exactly the same as the fly through setup. But in this case, you're just selecting a target point and you can also alter like the focal point for the camera and Rhino just generates a, a series of frames around the point. Uh, you can also control the direction and rotation, but I just did a 360 degree rotation around my screen. Uh, so 
these are similar to kind of uh, the animations that Lumion or Twinmotion or, or um, software like that can offer, although this is much more at like the diagrammatic scale. You don't, unless you're going to add all the entourage to your Rhino model, you really don't get as much information as you could in, in Lumion. Um, so that brought me to Grasshopper animation. Um, and I could really see this being used like in studio, for example, for volumetric diagrams or programming. Um, I kind of used it more of an assembly uh, method, but you could also really detail this out and create like a mobile construction detail um, and then just showing your design process. So this is kind of the basic script um, and my tutorial walks through like what each step is or what each component is in this script. Um, but basically how you create the animation is through the sliders. So in my example, I, I used my components of the screen and I moved them um, in the X, Y, and Z directions to all come together at the end. So it highlights kind of each component and then shows like the final image. Um, but using the slider to move these objects, you can pretty easily just right click on that slider and grasshopper and it will animate for you in the same way that it animates the fly through. Uh, or the rotation. So uh, kind of what I alluded to with the material issue is that even though I had the material set up using human, it, it uh, showed up kind of in this pink color and I just couldn't get rid of it even though it's supposed to be stone. But that basically uh, sums up how you animate in Grasshopper and I plan to upload the tutorial once I figure out that color issue. That's all I have. All right. Very good. I think definitely we're going to have some discussion at the end for animation. Um, glad to see you compare the native Rhino animation with the Grasshopper animation. It's good. All right, um, so thank you. Um, Andy, let's move on to um, Michel. So you all can see my PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So I was looking at um, ladybug scripts to analyze radiation and solar heat gain, um, specifically on a house that um, I recently did a major renovation to and am now living in. Uh, so to start off, I'm just going to define ladybug, uh, why you should use it in general, and how I used it and then go forward with um, some later applications that I think might be relevant. Um, so Ladybug, as uh, many of you are familiar, um, focuses on weather data and how you can use this data to help um, with your design. Um, but Ladybug is also a larger collective of other applications, including Honeybee, which is lighting analysis, Butterfly, which focuses on wind, uh, Dragonfly, uh, which focuses on heat and heat islands. So uh, all these can connect to multiple 3D design platforms and I used it in Rhino. Um, and like I touched on earlier, um, Ladybug uh, helps you with your um, design by collecting weather data. So um, you can use it for solar heat gain, uh, analytics, sun path graphics, um, thermal comfort, uh, and many other things. How I used it, um, like I said, was on my house. So I had this 3D model um, of my house that went under a very large renovation. Um, so this is the front of it, which is facing north. Um, but what I'm focusing on are my large south facing windows, uh, which you're seeing here that have very little, if any, um, shading solutions on them right now. So uh, my dad and I are hoping to get some shading um, and I try to use ladybug to see what would be appropriate. So first I'm going to focus on these large um, windows on the top floor deck. As you can see there's a bit of an overhang uh, already. It's about two feet. Um, so as we'll see that proved to be helpful. And then these smaller windows that actually lead to my dad's office. There's only about a four inch overhang there. 
um, so much less significant and we'll see um, the difference. So starting off in Ladybug, you need this component um, that sort of runs in the background of your grasshopper and uh, just allows you to run your scripts in Ladybug. Um, and then you have to collect your weather data. So um, this is a collection of all the EPW information, which is uh, environment plus weather information. Uh, as you can see, there's a bunch of data from all over the world. Um, so what I ended up using was data from Lunkin Airport, which is down in the bottom right of your screen. Um, and as you can see to the left um, is where my house is. So it was pretty close where I'm gathering this data from. Um, and this is sort of the basic script. So you can see that I'm taking my file path, which represents the EPW data, and then using the panel to read it out. So it is reading correctly as um, Cincinnati Lunkin Airport is where the uh, data is coming from. And then I wanted to run some more basic scripts. So um, you can see this one is going off dry bulb temperature, and it gives you this graphic. Um, and obviously, you're getting higher temperatures June, July, August. Um, and another one was direct illuminance, which is higher June, July, August, and same with direct normal radiation. So I wanted to use these months to focus on um, because that's where I would want uh, shading to stop um, heat gain. So um, the last thing I looked at was a sun path diagram. So you can see I added in this analysis period component where I'm saying I should only be taking data from June to August between the hours of 10 and 5 in the afternoon. Um, comes up to look like this. My house is on about a two degree slant from direct south and then these colorful dots you're seeing are the uh, times from 10 to 5 in the afternoon. And like I said, I'm focusing on these large windows at first with about a two foot overhang. Um, the house in total is a very complex geometry, so running it all in Ladybug at once uh, really bogged down my computer. So I split it up into just the basic um, form that you see here. And then in my script, you had to bring in your sky matrix. Um, which helps you run your radiation analysis. Uh, and for these sets of windows, I try to focus on um, different hours within a single day. So I used um, August 2nd. I picked this day because the summer solstice, um, the sun is so high up in the sky that I didn't think I was getting totally relevant information. Whereas if I picked a little bit later of a day, um, I could get a slightly lower sun path while also getting um, information that I thought was really relevant. So these are four different screen grabs from the same day. So you can see from the morning uh, at 9 a.m. all the way to 4 in the afternoon how the sun moves and there's a lot of um, radiation on these windows. And that's just like I said with the two foot pitch. Um, so for these windows, like I said, there's a smaller pitch, about four inches, and I'm uh, going to try and create a better solution uh, based off of the information that I gather. So um, you can see this is a, a little bit more on the analysis period where I'm going from June to August um, from 10 to 4 in the afternoon. And it's going to condense all that information into one graphic rather than going hour by hour like in the previous graphics. Plug that into your sky matrix. And here it is in its current condition with the four inch pitch. And then I added a foot pitch so you can start to see um, I'm already getting a lot more shading here. It's much more energy efficient. And this is a two foot pitch, which is similar to what you would see um, on the upper deck that we were looking at earlier, and it's very significant shading. Um, so you'd be saving a lot of energy just by extending the roof pitch uh, two feet. Um, so I'll run you through that again. And then I also wanted to make sure that I wasn't blocking the sun when I might want it. Uh, 
in the winter months. So I changed my analysis period from December to February, uh, again from 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, and plugged it in to see what I would get. As you can see, I'm getting very significant um, radiation here, which is a great thing because that's when you want it. Um, so the, the two foot pitch is doing uh, exactly what I would want it to. Going forward, um, so what I used was the radiation analysis plugin um, that I got from the, uh, the Ladybug website. Uh, but there are many more plugins that I think would be relevant, specifically Shading Designer, um, that I think could go forward and um, get more creative solutions for my project. So that's all I've got. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I look forward to you build a um, house based on analysis result. That'd be nice. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, so let's move on to uh, next person. I think Kirsten, right? <clears throat> Is Kirsten the next person? Right, um, I don't really see Kirsten here. She just, can you hear me? She just texted some of us in our group chat and said her computer is not working. She's Something taking it to uh, um, right. um, someone to get it fixed. That's OK. I think we can um, have her later, even you know, in group C. That's totally fine. Um, so do you want to go next, Stephen? Yep, I can do that. All right. So can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. All right. Um, I am doing my presentation is on rasterization versus ray tracing renders, um, which is kind of exploring how current render models use lighting versus future technology like ray tracing uh, uses lighting. Um, so today rasterization is the standard. It's what we all use and from Lumion to V-Ray to Rhino to just about anything, um, your favorite video games, your movie graphics, uh, it's used across all media platforms. Um, so the process of rasterization is basically taking a 3D, uh, dimension, a 3D object and then projecting it onto a 2D screen. And it does this through creating uh, a mesh of virtual triangles and polygons, and then using the vertices between those uh, individual polygons to hold information such as the position of the object in space, its color, texture, the direction of the face, so it knows if it's facing forward or backwards. Um, and then it transitions that information into pixels, which is what we have on our computers, our monitors, and our, even our cell phones. Um, and this diagram, this little detail here kind of shows you have your screen projected right here and it's taking the 3D object and um, projecting it into this 2D image through the use of individual polygons and triangles here. Um, as you can see, uh, I can't really tell if my screen's dark or not, but there is a shadow effect on the ground through rasterization and some slight reflection and refraction from the sun. However, if you were to move the sun behind these images, the, these models, the shadows would change, but the refractions and reflections wouldn't really change at all because it doesn't mimic that exact physics that it mimics the shading and that's about it. Um, and that's not to say rasterizations are bad. I mean, Lumion and other platforms have amazing render quality, lifelike. Um, but we're starting to hit the cap on rasterization rendering um, as we get into 4K display and 8K display. 
a uh, 4K display has 8 million pixels per screen, which is a uh, astounding number. And those each individual pixel has to refresh uh, 30 to 90 times a second. Um, and this is a very labor intensive, computational intensive uh, process on the computer. However, again, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't mean that it's bad per se. The image quality is bad, but we are reaching the maximum capac capacity or capabilities of what rasterization can do, um, which is where ray tracing comes into effect, also known as RTX. Um, ray tracing's different. It uses lifelike physics and um, how light travels through objects and through space uh, to create its rendering. So instead of you creating a polygon here, it's actually uh, using polygons to reflect the 3D images. It's just taking an actual image of the 3D objects in the scene, and then allowing the sun to actually reflect and refract and create shadow effects on each individual object. And it also takes into account how this how the shadow and lighting affects each individual material. So if it's a semi-transparent, it's a frosted glass or maybe a distorted glass, you would actually see shadow effects or lighting effects, rays, um, actually behave the way they would in real life. Um, this is just some more information about uh, how NVIDIA has gone about using research documents dating back to the 70s, um, about the research behind ray tracing and turning that into, uh, or taking that information and putting it into modern day graphics cards. Um, that's an another thing is instead of relying on CPUs, now uh, rendering would rely on GPUs, which is a graphics card. And it allows for much faster rendering times and actually a lot faster, like real time results that would look like the final image if you were to do a CPU render. So it allows for real time shadow, uh, distortions, all types of lighting effects in a very quick preview as to rasterization, which would just give you a semi like accurate lighting scenario and a quick render as to a long term render. Um, and there's just some quick examples I get into and in the demo, just giving some examples here. So in the left image, uh, let me, so in the left image, it's a slight, it's like, a. it's the same picture, but on left it's without the RTX and it's a pretty well lit, well lit room. You have different colors, different materials on each of these orbs. You can see there's like a hidden light here, directional light to show us shadows and distort and uh, reflections and distortions. Um, but when we turn on ray tracing, we see not only the materials, this orb becomes translucent and it reflects multiple colored uh, shadows, but it's also reflecting shadows in every direction and they're actually just reflecting off the other orbs due to their materiality. So, I mean, it's a quite significant jump from a standard render to a ray traced render. And another example is like a basic video game like Minecraft, which is a very basic game, no real uh, crazy quality in terms of uh, video output or textures or anything like or lighting or anything like that. Um, but you put it into this RTX mode, and now you're getting shadow and lighting effects and the an actual like 3D effect on the materials and each material is reading it the light as it comes through. Um, from this point I go into in the demo we kind of get into seeing this in person. I go ahead and show you guys a quick walkthrough in person just so you can understand like the game looks like this and then with ray tracing it turns into something like this where it actually does have an atmospheric feel um, and accurate lighting and then we kind of jump into modern like current technologies um, and current limitations of ray tracing so right now you have v-ray unreal engine and inscape that have ray tracing capability and so does rhino now rhino 7 anyway 
Um, and while it's at the very beginning of its process, you can already get an image like this, which this is through V-Ray um, using ray tracing capabilities. I mean, that's a very, very beautiful image. Um, but there are some drawbacks right now. Since ray tracing is less than 10 years old, um, the software the technology for it is very expensive. Um, you need an RTX graphics card in your computer to run it. My, I have one, and mine's a low-end computer in terms of the power behind my graphics card, and it is over a $2,000 computer. So an RTX graphics card will run you between two to $5,000. So the technology is very expensive still since it is relatively new in the sense of technology. Um, and because of that, you have a lot of companies that haven't invested in it or haven't learned how to use that technology to its fullest potential yet, which is why we still see a large majority of programs and softwares using rasterization instead of uh, ray tracing. However, ray tracing is only five years old or less, and it's already producing images that are just as high quality as uh, rasterization, which has been around for 20 plus years. Um, so the future is really, really the, the sky's the limit with ray tracing. It just, it's going to take more time of video game developers, software developers for rendering, um, even the movie industry and like your, your favorite Marvel film uses rendering softwares to create those back, backgrounds. It's just going to take more time and more investment into the technology to really push this newer form of rendering to the next uh, level and really set it apart from where rasterization goes right now. Um, and all that's left is YouTube link and we're excited. So yeah, it's really interesting, interesting stuff. Um, in the video, we kind of go over, you'll see a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison of a rendering in Rhino with rasterization versus uh, ray tracing and then we do the same in v-ray so it's really interesting um really interesting stuff and i think it has a really high potential where it's going to go next great well look forward to watching the full video thank you thank you all right um so let's move on to uh Rashed. Hi, um, so yeah, I'll share my screen. Uh, do I go? Okay. Um, just a second. Yeah, the button is on the top. On the right. Like, the like microphone. That. Yeah, button. Mm -hmm. Can you see the screen? Uh, no. Um, the share button is on the upper right. Okay, but no, yeah, I clicked yep, that. But All right. Yep, I saw it now. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, hi everyone, I'll be uh, basically talking about environmental analysis plugins for Grasshopper and mostly in detail Ladybug and how from a person coming from not a software background like I don't have explored that much. How can I as a person and people like me can use such tools which are becoming day and day more uh, user friendly and, and uh, use these tools to analyze and make more environmentally conscious uh, designs. So um, I uh, start with talking about Ladybug and Honeybee. So there are a lot of uh, plugins available at your disposable at your disposable uh, disposal at Food for Rhino if you'll go at that site. Um, but most of them talk about specific features that you can use in your design. But um, 
plugins like uh, ladybug um, and honeybee are more holistic or and more uh, comprehensive plugins in which uh, just by using one plugin you can get a um, lot of significant amount of varying data that can help you design um, your structure in a more informed way one of the best features about ladybug is that it directly works with apw files that are energy plus weather files which are collected and uh, maintained by the us government and many other organizations so um, Practically, they have mapped out uh, years of statistics data that you can now transform into a 3D language which can be um, used while you are designing and um, understanding how your design intervention works in that particular site and area. Honeybee, in, on the other hand, is a sort of a subset of Ladybug. So Ladybug works on a macro level where you have the whole site as uh, site analysis that you can do. Honeybee works at how your individual structure, um, the design that you're doing or um, how um, design elements uh, like your, uh, suppose your wall insulations, your fenestrations, how they are going to affect your internal spaces or internal um, dynamics. So um, as uh, like I'll go further in differentiations between these two, but yeah, these are in general that. So as you can see that Ladybug deals with all of these aspects. So this is one plugin that you go to when you can get these uh, around um, 10, 15 uh, data uh, studies, which can easily help a person, a designer to understand um, what other changes that you are making will be affecting to your building as well as the site. And uh, we um, we explore more on these in the tutorial where you um, go on and understand these few of these basic tools that are there. Same is with Honeybee, but if you see now the tools that are at your disposal, they are more um, individual uh, unit base like how your HVACing so it helps you uh, what kind of sizing is appropriate for your unit for HVAC or what's the thermal comfort inside due to your um, fenestration or your facade design so they it goes on a micro level and it's more um, based on your design now another uh, because all of these are open sources file so what happens is that few plug plugins need other plugins to work and honeybee is um, sort of that plugin which needs um, uh, plugins like radiance open studio energy plus and these plugins to actually function and give you a data but ladybug itself has its these plugin uh, these features of these other plugins in build for you to have that quick access and that um, comfort so as a user who um, so most of my research was based on the fact that if I am a new person who is not that accumulatized to uh, softwares or new to the, that, which is the plugin that is more user friendly and giving me the most um, useful data. So Ladybug was the one that sort of provided me with um, all that because it's it just uses your rhino grasshopper file and the epw file and then it just provides you with the data whatever data that you require in a very interactive visual um, representations while honeybee is itself uh, a bit difficult to get it on your laptop then getting these um, different or other open source plugins and then running them through so you need to learn about these suppose these are the few examples these examples to actually get your data out of it so this is a just a, a quick um, differentiation about what does ladybug and honeybee do they are more or the same but again as i said the major difference is the scale that they work in um, so like climate analysis, Ladybug also does the same thing, but it'll do it on a very broader scale, like the whole site, how the wind flow is affecting not just your building, but 
um, neighboring buildings as well. But Honeybee will work mostly in respect to how the wind flow is doing from your fenestrations or in your building interacting with your surface or your facade and impacting the internal spaces. So things like that. Um, an another like energy modeling. So um, Ladybug cannot do that. You cannot understand how the thermal like uh, impact the indoor impact will be in ladybug but in honeybee it can be easily understood and um, worked upon dependence on other plugins so honeybee lacks a lot because in this aspect because it's dependent on another plugins which just makes it more harder to access then um i just run down uh, how to install these um uh, how to install this plugin. So as I said, Honeybee is a subset of uh, Ladybug. So once you download Ladybug, you automatically get Honeybee. So um, it's just a um, few steps I talk about um, before somebody goes and sees the tutorial so they could just have a rundown on how to install the uh, plugin and because this plugin has a different set of steps how to install the good thing is that the, the zip file has an instruction um, pdf also included where you can just click and get the link and get the steps how to install it um, so uh, how you go about it and then um, what's the main thing that you need to do before starting any project the ladybug needs to it needs to fly so um, otherwise your project won't work and I'll, I, before starting this I didn't really know about this so I struggled a lot so this is an important step that needs to be done then this talks about how to get an APW file the the metadata that these guys have on the ladybug tools um, you can just literally select so many places any places that you want and you'll easily get the access to those data and yeah, it's just same, just a step by step because these initial steps are really important. Otherwise, your all the other inputs won't really work. Then um, this is one very important aspect that I thought was worth mentioning was the syntax that how these components work in uh, Ladybug is that if you have the underscore on the left, that is a required input that needs to be there in the component. Otherwise, the component won't give you the desired data. If you have it under both the sides, which is default, it is already mentioned, which can be changed according to your preference, but it's already been set to default by the software itself. And the other is the optional. So on that basis, um, like I talk about that in the video where these come and play and how these are helpful um, so this is just a um, screenshot of the tutorial where we build a very basic site and analyze a few different tools that anybody um, who is starting out with the um, grasshopper or even uh, rhino can use at their disposal and get the data that they really want like they don't need to worry or go into in depth about these these are the basic steps that you can go through that's in the tutorial so that you can easily get the data that you require and um, design accordingly of course this these platforms are very wide and they have a lot of opportunities in terms of exploring, but my aim was to just give those basic tools at disposal so that people can get started and then move forward accordingly to their comfort level. So yeah, then the benefits of using these environmental plugins is that um, it actually encourages um, and like it has made making environmentally conscious de uh, designs more accessible to every designer, every, every most of the people. And um, it provides a very interactive um, and integrative design platform. So it's just not just data that you are going through. You are actually seeing the 3D visual representations. So you are understanding more. Like I know the sun goes from east to west, but how does that go? How does that impact on my site? How uh, everything has been more accessible and um, yeah like you can get n number of factors that are responsible for a good um, green design at your disposal to make a very um, conscious and um, conscious decision so yeah 
then these are the reference and resources there are n number of resources available like most lot of people have their these but these were the few ones that were uh, most of them were by the people who created um, these platforms and they have a good resource so people can actually go and they're easy to read and learn so um, you can easily go and access these so I thought these might be helpful and some things that I referred. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's move on to Colton. I'm sorry, just to cross check my screen sharing stopped, right? Yeah. Oh, my button doesn't yes. seem to. Yeah, once Coden take over. Here we go. Yep, I can see our screen now. Okay. Yep, it's good. So I did my research and research topic was additive digital fabrication, um, creating controlled chaos in 3D printing. Um, so just a little bit of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but first I wanted to start off with like what's additive or what's additive fabrication and 3D printing and like why to use it. Um, so people use 3D printing a lot because it's speed, like it's very quick, it's accurate and pretty cost effective modeling tool um, from day to day. Um, and it it's easier for designers to model out complex designs in physical form. Um, and then it allows a designer to move through design cycles a lot quicker than normal because they're allowed to, you just upload it to the software and let the machine do its thing and you can start on whatever you need to next. Um, so then as you can see in the seven steps here, um, but just the traditional workflow of um, 3D printing, so creating your closed geometry and forms and your 3D modeling software, which my preference is Rhino. Um, and then you take that object and you save it as an STL that you can upload into your 3D, like when you have a 3D printer, there's a specific um, slicing software that comes with it, um, like Creality or Curia. Um, so you upload your file, your STL file into there, and then the program um, slices and will add infill to your geometry to make sure that it, the fail, like the ability to fail is lessened. Um, and then sometimes you can also set things um, like specifying the speed of the print um, so that it will take less time, but obviously that'll affect the outcome later on. Um, and then once you have all your set desired settings, the software will save your file as G code, which will be in turn uploaded um, into your 3D printing machine. And then once you do that, obviously you begin the print. And then when your print is done, you remove it and um, remove excess material that would be printed with it, and then you know polish it to make it up to your standards. Um, but mainly what my tutorial talks about is like being able to manipulate G-code um, to make the process not just like, a, you know, recreating your finished product from online, but actually using the system as like a design tool. So being able to manipulate to get a design from the process instead of just having it be like, okay, well, I've done my whole process now, you know, here's my final, you know, um, pristine model but actually using it as like a form finding tool as you design. Um, so the components of G-code, um, your overall 3D model is broken down into slices um, that are printed on one, one on top of each other. That's the additive nature of additive um, manufacturing. Um, and then these slices can vary in thickness a little bit. Obviously this is all done in millimeters. Um, so, you know, it's not, overly much, but it definitely is a little bit. Um, 
and then those slices are broken down into points, um, which are read as X, Y, and Z axis. Um, and these designated points are spaced evenly along um, your slices of the of your geometry. And then what the printer reads is these points. Um, so it's not going in a line. It goes in a line just connecting point to point. So it's going to take the past of least resistance from each of those points. Um, so then the greater of number of points that you allocate along each slice, um, the better resolution your final geometry will have, which what I mean by resolution is it'll have a lot smoother and crisp appearance instead of, you know, sometimes it'll be boxy and pixelated. Um, but obviously with all these extra steps, that'll take a longer time to print. Um, the material extrusion, you know, can be turned on and off. And then the same amount of material um, is extruded from point to point. Um, but again, this is something that we can manipulate later on. Um, but again, it, it'll add time. Um, the speed um, can be, you know, this is some, one of the settings that normally you can uh, mess with in your slicing software. Um, so if you need it really quickly, you can up the speed, but you know, this will affect your quality of print coming out. Um, so you normally wanna have it on the lowest speed which will lessen the fail rate and um, make a better quality model. Um, so then actually like further going into G code and like certain commands. Um, so you obviously have the points of your um, points and coordinates of your sliced geometry that the printer is gonna read, but all, the printer also needs to be told to start and stop. So these are just some basic commands um, that you'll want to perform to start your machine. So like G28 is to move home. So 000 and the X, Y, and Z coordinate. And then just like M104, S190 um, is to actually heat up the extruder because you need to, the plastic's hard and it needs, the heater needs extruded um, to allow for the plastic to come out of it. And then just like M140, S50, um, you also want to heat the bed um, because you don't want hot plastic on a cold bed. So you kind of want to have a happy medium there. And then when you look at the point coordinate system, you'll have this long thing here in the middle. Um, but basically, that's just telling the machine to go to the coordinate point 30, 20, and 1. And then the E tells it to extrude, and then the F tells it um, what speed to move at from point to point, um, which you can see broken down. And then obviously there's just like tips and tricks um, along the bottom there, as you can see. So then this is like the bulk of the tutorial, um, but it's you know a basic way of in Grasshopper being able to take a uh, geometry and set it as a B-rep, but then eventually breaking it down into your own G-code that you can manipulate. Um, and that's, you know, the main bulk of the tutorial. Um, so I'm not gonna go too deep into it because it's pretty complex. Um, but in my research, um, I've actually like done some of this. So this was a box that I printed with um, infill and then covered up. Um, but you can see that. But then by um, changing my G code and like lessening the points along the slice, um, I actually get these two other boxes. So by lessening the points, you can see how it's a lot like the top of it's just completely stringy and you can actually see through the box. Um, but then on the other side, I added more points. So then all that stringiness is gone, but it has a cool wave in it. Um, and just a top view of those. Um, but I've also done this before in concrete and uh, in my undergrad, um, which is when COVID hit. So it was kind of like an interesting to like finally put a bow on this and actually like finish up the research. Um, so I, you know, I made this create or I created this with um, fiddling with G code and Grasshopper. And um, one benefit of it is, you know, all that, um, all that the 3D printer thought it was printing was just a simple plane. 
but what I got was this because of the material and tampering with the G code and like the extrusion and the speed. So like along the corners, up you know, along the corners, you can see this really uh, thick line. And that's because I was able to go in and up my um, extrusion. So I knew I was gonna get this fat line, but obviously between the randomness and the randomness of the material, you know, you're not, you're not exactly sure how that's gonna turn out. So it gives a little bit of randomness, like you know what's gonna happen, but it also gives a little bit of randomness. So like you can get a surprise in the end. Um, and again, just, you know, this was a research of where it was printing a plane, but um, I tampered with the G code to make the um, Z axis oscillate above the plane when it's printing. Um, to create this like interaction with the rebar. And then that's what I had tampered with it so that I knew this valley was going to happen. But again, the way that it interact, like the way that the concrete was printed to interact with the, you know, this uh, wire mesh, um, it, you know, creates a new form that I knew, you know, that this ridge would happen, but I didn't know exactly how it would happen. So it's an interesting um, form finding thing. And again, um, tampering with the g code i actually moved i moved the starting point up um an inch or it was a half an inch so that when this it was just a simple cylinder but when it printed um obviously it had to fall a half an inch before it actually stuck to anything so that's where it gets these cool coils and all that and then again this was just um, creating a gradient of the extrusion so obviously here it starts off really small but then as it works its way, I, you know, manipulated the G code to start extruding more and more as it went along, creating these, you know, from the stent, the super fat line. Um, and then I was inspired by one of my past professors who I had at OSU. Um, his name was Zach Cohen. And, you know, this was stemmed a lot from part of his research. Um, and, it, you know, it's you're thinking like, you know, why would you do all this? Like, what's the whole point of this process? Why can't it just be like, you know, I finished my model, here it is. Well, it's, you know, to actually, it's to not just use this tool as a, you know, final pristine thing at the end, but to actually use it as um, a process to get to an end and to discover new things. Um, so it's really, labor intensive at the beginning, but once you know what you're doing, you know, you can actually create pretty cool aesthetic, both aesthetic and structural things. Like um, my professor, um, this this is what he did with manipulating G-code. He actually created the structural column that um, with the interaction of the concrete and the rebar, you know, starts to pick up the fluting that traditional columns has. Um, and then just my references and bibliography. Very cool. Quick question. Um, so your printer is able to print cement or clay? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, really interesting research. I like the controlled chaos. Uh, that really makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so let's move on to rate. Okay. Um, so I researched um, landscape design using Rhino and Grasshopper, um, and I focused on the Bison plugin for Grasshopper and how it can help generate site models for projects. Um, so just for the introduction, it's mostly a landscape architecture plugin for Grasshopper. Um, it mostly deals with uh, a mesh and it can provide um, multiple different um, uh, things that you can use. Um, it's actually still in its beta version. They have released another version after that, um, but it's a little bit less stable and it was designed for Rhino 6, but still works in Rhino 7. Um, so it, like I said, it's a landscape architecture plugin. Um, it deals mostly with topography meshes. 
Um, <clears throat> it can create a mesh. Uh, it has an analysis tools, editing tools, and it can also annotate it so you can um, be a little bit more informed with uh, where your project is placed. Um, so <clears throat> it, it keeps stuff uh, concise and very intuitive. Um, so it deals with slope and aspect and cut and fill. Um, watershed, which I didn't explore a whole lot, um, some modeling, and then mostly editing on the mesh. Um, so uh, the benefits of Bison for Grasshopper is that, like I said, it's much faster. It can perform some similar um, tasks that Rhino can, but it's a lot faster and a lot more intuitive, um, and you can make changes a lot faster. Um, so uh, the two uh, situations that I um, kind of recommend it most for is if you have a specific site plan with an existing topography, um, it's very easy to either create that yourself or take that information that's already provided. Like um, in my tutorial, I used information from the USGS website. Um, and you can make changes like grading or um, you'll see in some of the pictures later but you can you can change the topography very easily to fit exactly what you what fits your project um and then also you can create your own if it's like um a theoretical project or one that doesn't have a specific site but you just need it like on a hillside or something you can create very specific um realistic topographic maps really fast um and then on the analysis end, um, I thought that was very interesting and very useful for um, kind of pre-project things. Kind of like um, when people are talking about Ladybug, it can analyze like the roughness, the um, sun shading, that kind of thing. Um, so just kind of fast to see some tools. So you can remesh um, just like you can in Rhino, but it goes a lot faster and there's different kinds of meshes that you can remesh too, as well as over here is just a really simple fast form that I created. But again, something similar that Rhino does, but uh, it's a lot faster and you can make changes a lot faster. Um, um, editing tools, um, you can use points and curves to kind of edit the mesh uh, as well as um, this kind of grading tool, which I thought was one of the more useful tools um that it had and as you can see um, in the scripts they're very simple and easy to understand um, a lot of the inputs are very simple like you just have to put in your mesh and whatever you're editing with uh, like a curve a point um, a grid system with those like number sliders and it will very easily pull out the mesh that you want so it is very intuitive and very fast to work with um, and then just for some of the annotative and analysis tools here, you can see this is the roughness analysis and it's color coded for you. It also has an uh, elevation analysis tool um, for the annotative tools. I thought it was um, very useful. You can create the topographic lines in any way that you want. Unlike if you were to get like a topographic map off of um, the Internet or, or something, they tend to be in the concentric circle kind of form, but you can create whatever um, topographic lines that you want. And there are multiple different ways to do that. So you can do it again really fast and um, very specifically. Um, as well as I don't have a picture of it here, but you can um, analyze where it's at its highest and its lowest point and kind of change the mesh based off of that. Um, so that can really help your your project if you really understand the landscape that that you're in. Um, and that's just kind of the gist of my power, my presentation. Thank you. Well, this sounds like okay. maybe a very useful tool for our E5. You know, we draped the top surface, create a collision. Do you yeah, think this one will be useful to do something similar like the E5? All right. I will definitely look into it. I think you know we um, we have a little bit strange way, right, to work on the tunnels and the bridge. Maybe this one could be the alternative. Yeah, thanks for sharing with us. All right, uh, I think we are a little bit beyond uh, the class overtime.